Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight, we get to explore one of my favorite topics, food in Europe. My name is Ben Green, and before we get started, I just have a few viewing tips to share with you. Uh, first off, we do suggest that you view this uh, presentation in full screen. During the episode, you may see a video insert of Rick. Feel free to drag and resize this. Uh, we would suggest in one of the bottom corners and perhaps make it no bigger than around 10% of your screen. On the bottom toolbar, you'll see a Q&A widget. Please go ahead and use this to ask us questions. And later on tonight, we will have a Q&A session. Also of note, uh, we do provide Rick's food menu in advance at ricksteves.com slash MNT for Monday Night Travel and in the reminder emails for each of these programs. And uh, in addition, one other final note, uh, these, this presentation is recorded. However, the audio and video for all of you, our attendees is off. So please just sit back, relax, enjoy the show. Um, and one general announcement actually. Starting March 1st, we are moving these Monday night travel presentations half an hour earlier. So that means that the first show will start at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and the second show will be 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. So we hope that uh, you'll pick whichever one works best for you. And now I'd like to welcome our tour guide and fellow food connoisseur, Rick Steves. Uh, good evening, Rick. Hey, Ben. Good evening. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for Monday Night Travel. And today we're going to have a food festival. I'm very excited about that. You know, this is so great for me to be able to invite you into my home each Monday night. I feel like I'm, I kind of scurry around. I've got some food to put together and I want to make sure everything is looking OK. And now you all come in and I just hope you can be comfortable. And it's just a delight to have you. You know, there's a lot going on in our world, and I think for an hour and a half every week, we should just sit down and celebrate travel. Let's just pretend we're traveling. We can let these images and these ideas take us away. We can stoke our travel dreams. Uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of times I'm just wanting to give all these lectures, and it occurred to me, I've given the lectures. There, there must be 40 hours of my lectures available anytime for free at ricksteves.com. So if you want that, the lecture on what to see and do in each of these places, you can go there. Right now, we're just going to travel and have a lot of fun. So thank you for being with us. You know, on a normal year, I would spend 100 days in Europe, and then the rest of the time I'd be home, but using home as a springboard for getting around and going around the country and enthusing about travel. And I need to get out and talk, and this is my chance to do just that. Something we didn't anticipate when we started this Monday Night Travel Fund was that it would evolve into sort of a uh, a shared meal. And every week, I, I've, I'm i surprising myself. I'm getting into the cooking. And I want to share with you what I'm going to be eating tonight. And I uh, we put the, the menu on our uh, information so people can kind of eat with us. But look at this beautiful, beautiful plate. <laughs> I cooked this. My kids are saying, who is this man? I cooked this myself. It's nothing fancy, but it sure was fun to put it together. And uh, this is a Danish meal. This is called smorabrot. Uh, it, it means uh, butter on bread, smorterbrot. It's open face sandwiches. And all over Scandinavia, you'll find these open face sandwiches. You go into a shop and you just choose what you like. They have their flags. It's not a political or a nationalist thing. They just decorate with their flags in Scandinavia. It's just a fun loving thing. The smorterbrot, the, the open face sandwiches, are usually served bigger. And you just go into a shop and you pick maybe two and you eat them with a spoon, with a knife and a fork. But I made them smaller so we could have more variety. I'd like you to meet my, my, my dinner tonight. Oh, this is herring on, um, herring on rye bread with butter. And you've got onions and dill. And this one here is, what is this? This is smoked salmon with cucumber, radishes, and dill, and romalade. Romalade is the Scandinavian kind of tartar sauce. If you can't find romalade, just use tartar sauce. Here we have the uh, one of the, the major kinds of sandwiches. It's roast beef with butter, and uh, and it is with um, horseradish so sauce and with uh, fried onions and little pickles. And then here we have a delightful one. This is on a vasa cracker rather than um, rather than uh, the the hard bread. This is just a crunchy vasa cracker, which are popular in Scandinavia. And we've got our tartar sauce. We've got our hard boiled eggs, we've got our shrimp, and I sprinkled a little bit of caviar on the top with my dill. And then this, for me as a Norwegian boy, is our dessert. And this is the, the Norwegian goat cheese. 
Mm. And I'm going to be delighting in that when I'm done with these sandwiches. But that's our dinner. It's called Schmorbrot. And we're going to be drinking Danish style. I got my Carlsberg beer. But before I get into my Carlsberg beer, I'm going to have my fire water. And this is Akavit, Arlsberg, Arlborg. And uh, Jubileum is one of them. It's supposed to be about the best kind you can get, uh, according to my Danish friends. And strong stuff. I've been drinking this already for a couple of hours here because this is a double hitter. And this is the second show. But yo, that is good. Now, Danes will throw it down. I'm not going to do that because I got to still be standing up here in a while. But um, this is normally caraway, but this is dill. This particular kind is dill. It's got this wonderful warm tone. It's just great with your herring. And this is sort of, well, literally, akavit. It's the water of life. And every country has its fire water. And the Scandinavians are really into their akavit. When they drink, it's very important in Scandinavia, you get eye contact, meaningful eye contact, skull, and then you throw it down. Ooh, a tour guide story is Skull, the Scandinavian Prost. Cheers. It's from the old Viking days, the skull, and they would drink it out of a skull. <clears throat> it's probably baloney, but some tour guides like to say that. Okay, so that's our food. Now, I'm going to collect some uh, 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 little uh, video clips here, and I'm going to take you right now to our Classroom Europe program. And this is classroom.ricksteves.com. This is free. It's designed for teachers and homeschooling parents. Uh, uh, and uh, it is for me just a delight to be able to share this tool for travelers and teachers. It's free, it's fast, it's fun, there's no ads, and we've got 500 clips, easy to search and put together your playlist. So I'm going to do a food theme. So let's look in the themes here, and we don't want architecture, we don't want no war, we want food. I click that, and we got instantly 56 different clips on food, and let's get specific by the country. So here we have all of our countries. And let's go to Italy. So food, Italy, there's 15. And if we look at this, uh, let's just pick a couple. Um, I love the Signor Gori. It's an aristocratic family. They rent a farmhouse B&B, and we're going to have dinner with them. It's wonderful. Oh, and here's Bobo. He's my favorite restaurateur, my favorite restaurateur in Florence. So let's go have dinner with Bobo. And then uh, that's a couple of Italy ones. Let's go out of Italy, and let's go into France. And if we look at France, we've got six clips that are food in France. And here's my friend Arnaud, the quintessential Parisian tour guide. And let's have the quintessential French meal with Arnaud. All right. Now to go a little quicker along here, let's just look at some other countries. So let's go. We'll get something from Greece. We'll get something from Belgium. We'll get a food clip from Switzerland. Why not Austria? And let's go east. Let's go to Palestine and let's go to Israel. OK, so I clicked those. We've got food. There's 15 from those places. And let's just choose our favorites. I love the Greek Isle of Idra. And this is a mom and pop restaurant where you really get home cooking. That is for sure. I just love eating in Israel. And if you eat anywhere in the Holy Land or in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's olives. So let's go to Palestine and harvest some olives. And what else shall we have? Oh, this, this crazy guy here is uh, evangelical about French fries in Belgium. And we'll go to Vienna for the new wine festival, the Heuriger. And let's finish off in Switzerland with some cheese made high in the mountains. So now we look at our list here. We've been building a playlist. And you can see it has nine videos for 25 minutes and 23 seconds. I think that's about right for us tonight. So here we have our playlist. This is all on Classroom Europe. Any of you can do this anytime. Of course, you can organize your, your clips any way you want. Let's start off with Idra. So we got Idra at the top. Now you can share this playlist with the public so everybody can access it, or you can collect your own little bank of playlists. And that's what I'm doing. We got to give it a, a name and let's call this uh, Food fiesta, uh, fiesta, no, Festival. And we'll go Monday Night Travel. Okay, so we're just going to save that. Bam. Now I can look in my playlists and I will find a thing called Food Festival Monday Night Travel. We can click that and we are on our way. So we're going to start out with the Isle of Idra. 
that starts with a H, Hydra, but it's pronounced Edra. It's just an hour and a half from Athens. And you go here, it's traffic free. These destinations, we're gonna be looking at them as destinations and good places to eat, but we'll set the tone with this great island of Edra, your best island side trip from Athens. And then we will have a mom and pop local style. Talk about home cooking. We're gonna get that on Edra. So now I'm gonna take you to the wonderful Isle of Idra, and we're going to enjoy some Greek cuisine. Thank you so much for joining us on Monday Night Travel. It's the hydrofoils that sit from Athens to the islands and from island to island. It's fast but less scenic as the passengers are stuck inside. I like to hang out in the windy doorway. After a 90-minute ride, Athens is a world away, and we pull into the Isle of Idra. Its main town, also called Idra, is home to about 90% of the island's 3,000 residents. After the noise of Athens, Idra's traffic-free tranquility is a delight. I'm glad I'm packing light as I hike up to my hotel. Idra is one of the prettiest towns in Greece. Its superb harbor is surrounded by an amphitheater of rocky hills. There is an easy blend of workaday commerce, fancy yachts, and lazy tourists on island time. Donkeys rather than cars, the shady awnings of well-worn cafes, and memorable seaside views all combine to make it clear you found your Greek isle. Idra was a Greek naval power famous for its shipbuilders. The harbor, with twin forts and plenty of cannon, housed and protected the fleet of 130 ships as the Greeks battled the Turks in their early 19th century War of Independence. The town stretches away from the harbor, a maze of narrow cobbled streets flanked by whitewashed homes. In the 1960s, the island became a favorite retreat for artists and writers who still draw inspiration from its idyllic surroundings. One of the island's greatest attractions is its total absence of cars and motorbikes. Instead, donkeys do the heavy hauling today, just as they have through the centuries. And I suppose for just as long, they've treated children to rides okay. as well. So we're gonna leave the center and we're gonna hike up to the edge of town. We're gonna find a mom and pop that just are famous in this community for serving people dinner in their home. This was uh, the first time I ever went to this place. I was with one of our tour groups. I took a Rick Steves tour to Greece and our guide was Cullen, and, and all of our guides know these things about each of these villages we sleep in. But what we're trying to do here is get home cooking. And all over this corner of Europe, you've got places that you don't know, is it a private home or is it a restaurant? It's a little bit of both. And we're going to enjoy it now for this wonderful, intimate, insider's look at this local culture, home cooking in Greece. At the top of the town, the humble Taverna Leonidas has been around so long, it doesn't need a sign. The island's oldest and most traditional taverna was the hangout of the local sponge divers a century ago. These days, Leonidas and Paniota feed guests as if they're family. And tonight, the place is all ours as our enthusiastic cook welcomes us into his kitchen. So what are we cooking? We cook lamb. With the roast potatoes, grilled shrimps. Oh yeah. With oil lemon sauce, calamari with a garlic sauce. Very good. Uh, Spanakopita, spinach pie. Spinach pie. Mm -hmm. Eggplant. Yeah. And then the beans. And before we know it, Leonidas has us all sitting at the table, and he starts bringing in wave after wave of his fabulous dishes. Here we go, the shrimp. Yeah, the shrimps, grilled shrimps nice. with the oil lemon sauce. Okay. <laughs> a fleet of taxis shuttle people to outlying hamlets and beaches. We're catching one for a windy survey of the island and to be dropped off for a scenic hike back into town. Idra is popular with walkers who come to explore the network of ancient paths that link the island's outlying settlements, churches, and monasteries. And in springtime, hikes come with fields of wildflowers. 
A delightful way to cap the day is to follow the coastal path to the village of Kamini. Its pocket-sized harbor shelters the community's fishing boats. Here with a glass of ouzo and today's catch, as the sun slowly sinks into the sea and boats become silhouettes, you drink to the beauties of a Greek island escape. Wow. That was a beautiful place for a nice glass of ouzo and a sunset. We asked, uh, we, 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 I had hiked there myself on a previous trip and I found this little spot. It's my favorite, favorite little perch on Idra as the sun's going down. And uh, we had the ouzo and we had the sunset going on, but we just needed something more on the table. So we asked for some calam calamari and we got, we got to look at like our entire octopus there. And uh, that's a little bit of language bear. You got to roll with those punches. But right now we've got that last minute of the sun going down. We got the perfect light. And it is just for me as a TV producer, so exciting to be right there with a nice glass of ouzo. If I was in Denmark, I'd have a nice glass of akavit, same sort of thing, enjoying the moment. Nowhere else does the historic and cultural timeline of Europe reach so far back while being so vibrant today. I hope you've enjoyed our look at Athens, the Oracle of Delphi, and the romantic Isle of Idra. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Adio. Adio. So remember, this was taken from the Athens show. I like to show a big city, but I always like to show a way to get out of the big city. So if you're going to Athens and you want to get out of the big city, catch the fast hydrofoil to the Isle of Idra. It's the perfect day trip. And if you want to see the whole sequence, of course, you can go to ricksteves.com and see any of our shows at any time for free. I do want to remember or remind you that uh, Ben is standing by to field your questions. And uh, after the show, we're going to answer your questions and uh, connect with you that way. So if you have got any questions, write them in that little Q&A widget there. Also, now we're going to go quick change into Tuscany. We're going to go to an aristocratic farmhouse. And they had a wonderful dog. I love Downton Abbey. And I don't know if you remember the beginning of Downton Abbey where the camera would follow that white dog towards the mansion. And we decided we're going to do a little Downton Abbey thing. So we tried to follow the dog with the camera. It's tough to follow a dog that doesn't know how to take instructions. Uh, but we even have the Downton Abbey music a little bit here. So that gives you a little sense of Downton Abbey as we go to my favorite agriturismo in Tuscany. And here we're going to have what I like to call a zero kilometer meal. Everything made right there and enjoying it with the family in Tuscany. Aristocratic countryside elegance survives in Tuscany. But for these venerable manor houses to stay viable, many augment their farming income by renting rooms to travelers. We're staying in a B&B run by Signora Silvia Gori. And like so much of what she serves, the lemoncello comes from her farm. Signora Gori rents a few rooms in her centuries-old farmhouse. As is typical of agriturismos, as working farms renting rooms are called here, the furnishings are rustic but comfortable. To merit the title agriturismo, the farm must still be in business, and the Gori family makes wine. The son, Nicolò, runs the show now, mixing traditional techniques with the latest technology in a very competitive field. Signora Gori is proud to show us her home. As her family has for centuries, she lives in the manor house. And the family tree makes it clear. The Gori family has deep roots and goes back over 600 years. So it says, Familia Gori. Gori Panellini. All the way back to? 1400. Okay. 1400. 1400. Incredibile. <laughs> the family room, the oldest in the house, is welcoming in an aristocratic sort of way. Under its historic vault, Grandpa nurtures the latest generation of Goris as the rural nobility of Italy carries on. Upstairs is the vast billiards room. For generations, evenings ended here, beneath musty portraits, another reminder of the family's long and noble lineage. And Grandma passes down the requisite skills to the latest generation. If that was bowling, that would be very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now it's dinner time. And I'll tell you, if you're staying in an elegant old world agriturismo or family farm in the countryside of any place in Europe, 
Oftentimes they will make a little extra money by serving dinner. And you can actually find yourself eating with the family if you're lucky. If that is happening, there's probably no menu. You just eat whatever they're cooking. It's right off the farm and it's great as you'll see here in just a moment. <laughs> the kitchen with its wood burning stove and fine copperware has cooked up countless meals. Signora Gori, happy to share the local bounty, invites us for lunch. Three generations gather on this Sunday afternoon with no hurry at all. The prosciutto and pecorino cheese provide a fine starting course, beautifully matched with the family's wine. Pasta comes next, and the children prefer theirs bianco with only olive oil. And the little one? She's still mastering the fine art of eating spaghetti. Food is particularly tasty when eaten in the community that produced it with a family that's lived right here for six centuries. It's memories like these that you take home that really are the very best souvenir. They call this a zero kilometer meal. Everything was produced locally. It's a classic Tuscan table. Simplicity, a sense of harmony, and no rush enjoyed with an elegant and welcoming noble family. Look at that. That is a beautiful setting. It happens all over Europe. It happens all over the world, of course. And when we travel, if we can connect, that's the magic. And that's your challenge. That was a classic Tuscan table. Simplicity, a sense of harmony, no rush, enjoyed with an elegant and welcoming noble family. If you have the opportunity, go for it. Now, we're going to go to Florence. Before I do, I want to, I'm going to leave my Akavit until later. I'll uh, drink to you all uh, after the shows. Oh, this is really good stuff, though, this fire water. Yo, uh, but I'm going to try some of this Carlsberg beer. When you go to Denmark, there's two main beers, Carlsberg and Tuborg. And uh, up until recently, that was all there was, just two great pilsners. Uh, now, all over Europe, you find craft beers are very popular. But um, uh, I'm going to go with my uh, Carlsberg here. And I kind of like the Carlsberg because when I drink Carlsberg, I am supporting the arts because the greatest art gallery in Copenhagen is called the new Carlsberg Glyptothek. And it is the Carlsberg Art Gallery. And all the beer drinkers in Denmark know that part of the profit goes to this wonderful art gallery. Boy, alcohol in Scandinavia is highly taxed and uh, it's highly taxed all over Scandinavia, but it's about double taxed in Sweden and Norway. Consequently, a lot of Swedes go to Denmark for their boozy weekends. And there's a lot of embarrassing Swedes that can't handle their Carlsberg very well. But when you're traveling in Scandinavia, one tip is to remember, if you want a beer or an alcoholic drink, it's very expensive in a restaurant, but the locals who are on a budget buy it at the local 7-Eleven or the convenience store and they sit on the curb outside or in the canal or in the park and have a little impromptu party with their friends. It's okay to drink outside in Scandinavia and you can get a good beer for $2, just like in the United States, if you buy it from the 7-Eleven and eat it outside. Okay, now we are going to take a sip. Some Carlsberg beer from Denmark. And I'm enjoying my, I'm making a pretty good dent in my Danish dinner. And I'm on to, I'm two sandwiches down, three more to go. I'm saving my yay toast, my goat cheese for the end. But I've got my roast beef and my shrimp with caviar coming up. But right now we're going to Florence. And in Florence, we're going to go to my favorite restaurant. And I want to remind you in Florence, they've kept the cars out of the center, which is great for tourists, great for the birds, but not good if you live in the suburbs or outside of town and you want to drive to your favorite restaurant if you're local. Consequently, a lot of locals are favoring restaurants on the periphery of the downtown. And if you want to leave the tourist zone and walk 10 minutes away from the center, there you're likely to find the very best deals and values and experiences in your Florentine dining. And that's what we're doing. We walk 10 minutes from our hotel out to Trattoria Tito. And that is uh, the restaurant that we're going to meet right now. Bobo is the wonderful character that runs this place. I also want to remind you, in Europe, especially in places like Italy and France and Spain. If you eat early, you'll be eating with tourists. If you come back later, you'll be eating with locals. If you go to Bobo's restaurant at 7.30, it's gonna feel like a touristy place. If you come back at 9.30, it's gonna be, there's not gonna be a tourist in sight and it's packed out with locals. So you decide what you like. Right now, we're going to Trattoria de Tito. My son, Andy, is joining us. It's so much fun to have Andy there. And we're gonna have the, the most unforgettable meal I've had in Florence. 
back out on the streets, it's fun to think that today, even a tourist can eat better than the princes and dukes of centuries past. My son Andy's taking time out from his travels to join us for a convivial Florentine dinner at Trattoria Tito. My favorite restaurants in Europe have a common thread. They're run by people who love their work. And Bobo, with his grande personality, runs this place with exuberance. Tonight, we're going with his recommendation, the Antipasto Extravaganza, a parade of plates with wine to match. I have to remind you, the real accomplishment is to find a restaurant where you trust the chef and you just say, hey, make me happy. I've got $50, bring it on, or whatever you want to spend. You can't do it on the cheap because it's all a matter of the best quality. You get the cheap meat, the cheap vegetables, the cheap wine, or you want some quality stuff. So you got to, you got to, um, you know, finesse that yourself. But this is something that I innovate with my guidebook work. I always just, um, if I find a restaurant I love, I negotiate with the owner to treat our travelers with my guidebook to something we've designed and named ourselves, And that's what this is, the antipasto extravaganza. This is what Bobo will bring you if you come to this restaurant. I just love when budget travelers can find an affordable opportunity to have a quality experience like this. Knowing what I'll be eating, he recommends a wine that complements the food. Dry enough to clean the mouth with the salamis, with the fats of salamis. Bobo, the consummate professional, tests the wine to make sure. I think it's perfect. <laughs> OK. This is the pecorino cheese. Uh, we used to age it in caves for 12 months. And it's perfect to eat with the honey yeah. or with the fava beans. You have to get a fava bean. You have to break it. Push out the bean. OK? That. That's nice. Eat it. And with a the, with the, with the piece of pecorino cheese, it's perfect. <laughs> Bobo beans. takes a break from his busy schedule to make sure the wine will still complement the fava beans. What dedication. <laughs> what dedication. So there, that's a real thing. The fava beans, the cheese, the wine. You don't get that in a touristy restaurant. This is full of locals and they're just celebrating their cuisine. In Italy, it is all about the ingredients. You want to eat them in season. The cheese, the meat the vegetables, the wine. If it's local and if it's in season, it's what the Italians call a good marriage. I really always love this idea that a smart eater going to a good restaurant in Europe can look at the menu and know where they are and what month it is according to what's being served. Europeans love to eat local and they eat with the season and so should we. Up next is bruschetta. And I love bruschetta, but I can't get a satisfying bruschetta here in the United States because I've been spoiled in Italy. I don't know, it's the bread or the olive oil or probably the ambiance. I cannot create the ambience of a great Italian restaurant here in a great American Italian restaurant. It just doesn't quite work. Um, we're going we're gonna to have bruschetta now, and we're going to enjoy some of these more extravagant toppings that Bobo loves to do. One of them is the lardo di colonnata. That's lard that's aged in boxes of carved out marble way up in the mountains of Italy where Michelangelo went to get his marble. And then it's served also with tomatoes just bursting in flavor. I want to remind you next week, next Monday night, we're going to be going to Rome with Francesca Caruso, my favorite Roman guide. And we are, I've already been talking with uh, Francesca. We're going to put together a bruschetta extravaganza. She's already told me what she's cooking. <laughs> I can't begin to compete with that. She's so good, but I'm going to make my own bruschetta and I hope you do too. So that's next Monday night. It's bruschetta time with some red wine and the insiders look at Rome. Right now, Bobo and some bruschetta. It's not a typical Florentine starter without the bruschettas or crostini as we call them. We have crostini with uh, seasonal mushrooms and then the lard, lardo di colonnata, spicy with black pepper and rosemary. And then the bruschetta with fresh tomatoes, basil, olive oil and garlic. We have the typical Florentine liver pate. Uh, I think it's time to change the wine. I was and just about to suggest that. A syrah, and it will be perfect with the, with the stronger cheeses and with the wild meats. Enjoy. I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> Bobo certainly enjoys his work. And you know, 
there's a magic about that in Europe. Europeans find their niche. And if you can find yourself in the aura of somebody who loves what they do for their living, this is what they do. He'll still be doing this 10 years from now. This is what Bobo does. And he does it with passion and he does it with love. I just, I was so happy to be able to have my son Andy there because uh, I remember when I was a kid, I couldn't afford to go to fancy restaurants and eat with like a no, no limit. And uh, I would just slum around Europe and uh, Andy loves to travel. He's a great tour guide and I love it when he drops by and he always happens to drop by just in time for a good dinner. He's a smart traveler. <laughs> Bobo certainly loves his work. Here you go. Okay, this is wild salamis this is deer salami this one is um wild boar shoulder this one is wild boar cheeks deer ham and wild boar sausages enjoy them with the wine it's kind of a harsh environment for a vegetarian i gotta say you know there's good vegetarian restaurants all over europe these days much better than it used to be but if you go to a trattoria like this and you're a vegetarian you really need to have a sense of humor and you need to be flexible. It's, it's, uh, they've got options for you, but it really is a festival of meat eating here in a trattoria on the suburbs of. Oh boy, here comes another wine change. Okay, okay. This is the Vin Santo. And these are our homemade Florentine biscuits. Okay, I gotta pause here. I'm sorry. I just, uh, this is takes me right back. You don't need to get a big fancy tiramisu dessert, just biscotti and vinsanto. That's the elegant dessert after a great dinner like this. You dunk your biscotti, these are homemade biscuits, and you get that sweet wine, that dessert wine, the vinsanto. So you dip them in the sweet wine for five seconds. Cinque, and then you eat them. Hmm, <laughs> like father, like son. Andy is a great traveler, by the way. He's one of our ACE tour guides. And we've got all hundred of our guides standing by, ready to do touring again. Like you, we're waiting for things to open up so we can all enjoy our travel dreams in action. The perfect end to a fantastic meal. Thanks to Bobo. Okay, now another quick change. We're going to Vienna and we're going to check out a little glimpse of the art and then we're going to get into the cuisine. I want to remind you, Vienna is situated right on the Danube River, right at the foothills of the Alps. When you stand in Vienna, you look up and you see those, those corduroy, like vineyard covered uh, uh, foothills of the Alps and you realize that's where the Alps start and they arc in a mountainous symphony all the way across Europe, tumbling into the Mediterranean at Marseille. So it starts in Vienna and just outside of Vienna in the foothills of those Alps, there are these wonderful vineyards. And in harvest time, they serve rustic meals to travelers and locals alike where you celebrate the new wine. It's a great slice of local life, hearty and tasty as can be. So the best way to match this rustic conviviality today is to head into the nearby Vienna wood. Here in the foothills of the Alps, locals enjoy their natural backyard. And amidst the famous vineyards, they gather for the ritual of tasting the new wine. The uniquely Viennese institution of the Heurige is two things. It's a young wine and a place to drink it. Long time ago, when the Habsburg emperors allowed Vienna's vintners to sell their young wine tax free, several hundred families opened up these wine garden eateries clustered around the edge of town, and a tradition was born. <laughs> Today, there are more than 1,700 acres of vineyards within Vienna's city limits and countless Heurige taverns. For a Heurige evening, ride a tram into this wine garden district, wander around, and choose the place with the best ambiance. Many locals claim that it takes several years of practice to distinguish between the young Heurige wine and vinegar. To enjoy a more refined wine, some vocabulary helps. Try the Gruner Veltliner, a dry white wine. Since Austrian wine is often sweet, remember the word trocken, that means dry. So when you're in Vienna and you feel like a little adventure, you hop on a trolley and it takes you out of town and into the foothills of the Alps, a trolley car. And at the end of the line, you get out and you're surrounded by all of these competing vineyards that are entertaining locals who go up there for the music, the dancing, 
the wonderful cheap wine, and the rustic cuisine. That's the Heuringer, and that's what you're looking for. The wine is cheap, and it's served by the Viertel. That's a quarter of a liter. A couple of weeks ago on Monday Night Travel, we were in, uh, in Switzerland talking about the wine, and they serve it by the deciliter. That's the tenth of a liter. I don't like that. You want a quarter of a liter. That's what's great about Austria. I want to remind you, on March 1st, we're going to be dining and drinking in Vienna as we celebrate the great musical experiences of Europe. And uh, we're going to eat just like Beethoven did. And I'm putting together the menu and we're going to be drinking this very wine. I've already bought my bottle, Gruner Veltliner. One thing I do when I'm in Vienna is I go for an expensive glass. It's an inexpensive wine. Get the best Gruner Veltliner you can find and it is quite good. If you, like, if you, if you don't appreciate white wine, try the, the top end Gruner Veltliner when you're in Vienna. While waitresses bring their wine, the food is self-serve. As is the tradition, they don't serve fine cuisine, only simple dishes and cold cuts from a hearty buffet like this. Clearly, no one's going hungry tonight. So here we have everything you can imagine in a traditional Viennese uh, country restaurant. You got your sauerkraut, your red kraut, Schweinbraten, Alp, Alp cheese, mountain cheese, some potato salad, and something I think is very important, schmaltz. This is lard, actually, and it's something uh, young people don't eat much, but the old timers love it. Mm, takes you way back. Lard. I'm smearing lard on rustic bread, and I'm doing it with great memories. I, you know, my very first Vienna memories was on my first trip to Europe back in 1969. I was 14 years old. My dad used to be a piano teacher, a piano tuner, a piano technician, and he started importing pianos from Germany and, and Europe. He imported the finest pianos in Europe, and the most expensive and beautiful piano was made and is still made in Vienna. It's the Bersendorfer. And, uh, you know, and usually they'll just mass produce pianos on a conveyor belt. In Vienna, they birth their pianos. The factory is actually a former monastery, and each piano is made in a, a former monk's cell. And I remember as a very impressionable 14 year old going with my dad to this piano factory and seeing and being impressed by the fine German craftsmanship. My dad would go over there and he knew the personality of his uh, customer in Seattle. And he would go there and every handmade piano would have its own personality. And they would line up these big shiny grand pianos and, and I could play the piano better than my dad. So I would play the pianos and my dad really knew how to analyze the sound. And he would listen to me play. And then he would think which piano's personality matches the musical personality of his customer back in Seattle. He would sign the sounding board, they'd put it in a box and ship it to Seattle. And that was the reason I went to Europe for my very first time. On that trip, after doing all the piano business, the piano salesman took us on Sunday out to a dusty little town in the border of Hungary. And we went to church in the morning. And then after church, all of us walked across the dusty square, past the fountain into the wine garden. And that's where everybody, young and old, a multi-generational family uh, community get together, would go after church and have their wine and their lunch. And I distinctly remember all of these crusty old people spreading this lard on this rustic bread and telling stories and the young people would gather around. And I gathered around with lard on my rustic bread and the man with his old handlebus, handlebar mustache told stories of witnessing the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in 1914. He was old enough to be there and see it. And I was young enough to really be impressed. And that just got me so inspired about all the fun and the history and the culture and the lard that you can enjoy if you go to Europe. And I was just a 14 year old tyke. Okay, now we're gonna go to Paris and we're gonna do something that really kind of Parisians kind of cringe, but we're going to eat all of the cliches, the touristic cliches in one sit down meal with my favorite Parisian tour guide, Arnaud. Okay, so this is the quintessential meal in Paris with the quintessential tour guide. And it's something to be mindful of when you go to Paris. You can check all this stuff out. Lard. I'm taking Arnaud to lunch. Against his advice, I'm eating all the Parisian cuisine cliches in one meal. Santé. This is a key, you know? Good, civilized way to start with a meal. So it's an aperitif? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the aperitif. The aperitif is, is to open your appetite. Oh, oh, Rick, look at that. It looks, this looks very fabulous. Nice. Yeah. Merci. Soup à l'oignon. So this is the first course? Yes, this is uh, the entree. And actually, you guys call the entree the main course when the entree is the starter in France. That makes Very sense, confusing. Yes? Okay, I have my escargot. 
and I just use this. Hello, yes. So you stab it? Yes. And, and you, you twist it out. It oh, out. look at that. It comes out eventually. It's very chewy, you will see. Oh, that's good. It's good, huh? Garlic, parsley. Good. You know, a lot of tourists don't want the escargot, but yeah. I, I love it. What is the history of the onion soup? Ah, uh, the onion soup is something you eat more in the winter time. Because, you know, it was to warm up the uh, employees of the central markets during oh, the night time. I, I eat the onion soup all the year. I know, but you guys, Americans, are eating everything all year round. <laughs> Let's see, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, this is actually the, the main course, plat principal, we call it in French. Plat principal. Plat principal. OK, the principal plate. Absolutely, yes. OK. Steak tartare. Steak tartare, yes. Very, very you famous. know what it's made of? No. It's fresh raw beef. This is raw beef. Raw beef, so very fresh. It's, the spice comes from the water such soles, the ketchup, the uh, mustard, the, the, the Tabasco, salt, pepper, and the yolk of, a, of an egg. And then you just mix that all together with the beef. You like it? Yes, I love it. You've introduced me to something new. This one is so good. I can't believe it. I'm eating raw beef and it tastes good. It is good, huh? Wow, especially with some red wine. Mm -hmm. That steak tartare, I mean, a lot of Americans just shrivel up and go, oh, no, I can't eat raw, raw hamburger. It's beautifully seasoned, and it's very, very high-quality ground beef, and it's done in a way that is delightful, but it's too rich for me. I would recommend trying it for sure in a nice restaurant that does steak tartare well, and share a plate with your friends as a side or something like that. You'll be glad you did. Next up, we're going to have a cheese course. I love a cheese course, as you know. And uh, sadly, with healthier lifestyles, the cheese course is becoming less popular. But seek it out. And you can have a cheese course as dessert with another glass of wine, as you'll see. Or you can have it as an extra course before your dessert. Or you can order a cheese course and a dessert for two people and have a little of each. But one way or another, don't miss the cheese course when you're in France. So we are, you know, having now the uh, cheese course, which is very important. You don't end up a meal without some cheese. And basically, you know, you order cheese to finish the wine, and then you order more wine to finish the cheese. It's a nice cycle. Oh, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> a vicious cycle. Ah, this is dessert time, Rick. You're having creme brulee, and I have a fondant chocolat. This is sacred, you know, for lunchtime to stop for at least an hour. We don't work. Look at these people, they've been here forever. <laughs> yes, it's sacred. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. Okay. Did you hear that sound? The spoon cutting through the crusty top of a beautiful creme brulee. Ah, takes me to Paris. I want to remind you, it is really important for the French people to stop what they're doing in the middle of the day and have a proper lunch. Arnaud was with us for six frantic days, running around, filming everything. We weren't enjoying this meal here. We were filming. It is complicated to film a meal, I'll tell you. And I'm so glad we got what we got. But it's just always kind of go, go, go when we're filming. Normally, we'd be having lunch, eating a sandwich in the backseat of the taxi. And Arnaud just couldn't believe that civilized people would do this. It's just a different sort of sensibility to the culture and how we should be living. It's so fun to be exposed to that and to learn from that and be inspired by that as we're traveling. So the coffee always comes after all of the food? After the dessert, always. What if you ask for your coffee with the meal? Uh, they would say, yes, sure, but it would come after the meal. They don't want to be rude. Okay. What a meal. No, oh, excellent, wasn't it? I'm heading for the Orsay Gallery. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. I'm finishing my cognac. Oh, well. Bye-bye, Rick. <laughs> so he's going to enjoy, and I'm going to run off and do some more sightseeing as a good tourist will. You know, Arnaud, to me, I've learned so much from him. He's a dear friend. And um, when I'm working with him, it's so interesting because I get a better understanding of this uh, complicated relationship Americans and French have. Uh, Americans tend to think the French people are rude. And the irony is, the French people are just more polite than we are. And we think that is rude. It's just, we don't get it. I mean, when I'm working, total strangers interrupt what I'm doing. They ignore our no, and they call me by my first name. Now, I'm an American and I think that's just fine. But to our no, it's like, what am I, invisible? And they just interrupt us. And what about your, your privacy? And they called you your first name without being introduced. So our no was put off by how rude these strangers were. And the strangers were put off by how rude our no was to think that they were confusingly rude the way they treated me. Our no is just classically polite in a Parisian way. 
as we travel, we will learn that. And that's a beautiful thing about our travels. Now we're going to go to the Holy Land. And in the Holy Land, like in so many other cultures, food is love. And I remember it was kind of frustrating, both in Israel and in Palestine. When I was finished, they'd bring more food. And I'm thinking, no, I'm finished. And I didn't want to leave any food to waste because there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, poverty around me and so on. And I just wanted to clean my plate, but they wouldn't let me clean my plate, especially in Palestine, because they wanted to celebrate their abundance. It was a matter of pride for them. A great thing about the food, both in Palestine and in Israel, is the meze style. A lot of little plates, and then you, you, you dip it and dip it, and it's just a beautiful way to eat. And you'll find that all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Each country thinks it's their own. This next one is uh, Israeli to the people who live in Israel. Tel Aviv is a young city. If looking for historic charm, you can stroll the original main drag, Rothschild Boulevard, with its nostalgic cafes and venerable buildings. But Tel Aviv is gleamingly modern and growing fast. Its infrastructure is impressive, and its new buildings look to the future. Its beach scene comes with some of the best sand on the Mediterranean. A world away from the religiosity of Jerusalem, the people here seem focused on living for today. In this culture, food is love, and it seems to celebrate the bounty of the land. We sat down with our guide, Benny, and driver, Kobe, to get an edible lesson in this part of Jewish culture. Hey, cheers. Lahaim. Lahaim, very good. So, Benny, could you say this is typical Israeli? Yeah, you can say this is typical Israeli. Everything that you see here is grown here locally. No, you could say this is Israeli, but it's also Arab cuisine. Yes. Everywhere. Now we we the... call it now Israeli food, but you can find it in the Arab countries, you can find it in Lebanon, you can find it in Ankara, all over the Middle East. Here we have eggplants with olive oil and tahini. Here we have the tahini itself. Here we have another eggplant salad with vegetables. That's the hummus, very famous hummus made from chickpeas. This is something special. This we call tabbouleh. It's made of bulgur and parsley and cucumbers. Very special, very tasty. It's okay to reach and dip your pita bread into it. You dip it in each of the salads, and that's the way to do it. No need of a fork or a knife. And Kobe, how do you say bon appetit in Hebrew? Bete avon. Bete avon. Bete avon. Thank you. Lahaim. Lahaim. So that was a great little banquet in the harborside town in Israel. And just about a half an hour to the east, we're going to go into the West Bank or Palestine. And here we're going to celebrate the culture, the heritage of the olive tree. You know, we hear about the Mediterranean diet. It's all about olive oil. And, uh, and, and, and we're going to go right now to things called biblical terraces, terraces that have been there for 2,000 years. And when we have this beautiful opportunity to see Palestinians harvesting the olives from their olive trees, we'll understand how it's so close to that culture. They say it's the poor man's tree. It gives without taking. It's a beautiful moment. And we're going to then stop into a uh, village wine press and feel the celebration of turning those grapes into what will become their precious olive oil. Our first stop is Batir Natural Park famed for its hikes through olive groves and ancient terraces. Here in the Holy Land, the land itself is holy to its inhabitants. And for Palestinians, the olive tree is a kind of lifeblood for their culture. We're in Palestine. This is Palestine. Like, these are the biblical terraces of Batir. And we call them biblical because they're over 2,000 years of age. My ancestors came here and carved these terraces into the mountains. It was the only way for them to survive. You know, the mountains are hilly. You need the terraces to plant on them. They did that at that time. And guess what? We exist till today. We're still here, only through them. That's why I love this place. This tells me this is where I belong. Here's an itinerary tip for you, and I think it's very important. When you are blessed enough to go to the Holy Land, don't fall into the trap of doing Israel and then making a quick little beeline to Bethlehem and seeing the church of the nativity where Christians believe Jesus was born and then scamper back into Israel where it's safe again. Spend substantial time on both sides of the wall. Get to know the Israelis, get to know the Palestinians. It's really important to give Palestine an opportunity. We had such a wonderful experience in Palestine where we are right now with people like Kamal, 
who you're talking with right now. If you want to see our one hour special on the Holy Land, go to ricksteves.com in the TV section and watch our one hour special on the Holy Land. We did it a few years ago. It is perfectly up to date right now. When you watch that, it is like being there today. Kamal is a Christian Palestinian. He's a guide. He's easy to hire. He's like, there's 40 English speaking guides like Kamal who are licensed and ready to do work for you when you go to Palestine. It's important to have a local guide to show you around when you're in Palestine. Kamal likes to tell the story of some of his tourists. They say, oh, you're a Christian. How long has your family been Christian here? And he says, oh, about 2000 years. I mean, these were the original Christians. I mean, this is amazing to go to the West Bank and walk through those fields, through those biblical ter ter uh, terraces with somebody whose family has been there for that long. It tells me this is Palestine. What do olives mean to the Palestinian people? Oh, olives, they're, they're the best trees. They're the poor man's tree because the olive tree gives without taking. The olive tree give us the olives without even needing us to do anything for it. It's October, and across the land, as they have since ancient times, families gather in the olive groves for the harvest. Children are led out of school for the week so they can work the trees with their parents. In the West Bank, 60% of the trees are olive trees. To Palestinians, the beloved olive tree represents their past and their future. As they say, it was planted by our grandfathers for us to eat, and we plant it for our grandchildren to eat. So we're into the olives, and I, I can't, when we're doing a TV show on the Holy Land, you can't really book everything because you really can't know what's around the corner very well. And we needed to cover this uh, section about olive oil. And we saw this wonderful family at harvest time with the children out of school, uh, collecting it with their mom and dad. And then we stumbled upon this neighborhood or this village communal um, olive press. And we dropped in, they're very friendly, sure you can film here. And we filmed and I thought it was a lot like uh, centuries ago in Europe, you would have a, a communal press. So a mill where people would bring their grain or their olives or, or whatever. And, it would be processed. And here we got to bring that home on our TV show. In nearby villages, families take their olives to the communal press to make oil. The ancient technique survives, though boosted by hardworking machinery, as a busy crew in oil-soaked shirts meets the demands of the harvest season. Rounds of olive paste are pressed into a weeping mass. The fresh oil, after filtering, becomes a golden liquid poured into jugs to be taken home. Okay, now we're in another big switch. We're going to Belgium, and we're going to drop in on a chef who I know from one of the, there's many uh, beautiful little restaurants in Bruges, a town that is my favorite town in Belgium. And we met this man who just is evangelical about his French fries. And we wanted to drop in and watch him make the French fries and learn. And when we look at this man, again, this is a European who's found his niche. He loves what he does. He does it with passion. He's proud of his work. He gets great joy out of it. And we get great joy out of patronizing him. Working up an appetite, you'll be tempted by the smell of French fries. Called Flemish fries here, they're a local specialty. And in Belgium, fries are an art form taken very seriously. Who made the first fry? Belgium. This potato was peeled this morning, cut in pieces, and put in that fat. So you, you, you actually cook it in the grease two times? Two times. Once in that, then it rests here. Afterwards, second time, high temperature. Low temperature. Resting, cooling, high temperature. These are forming a skin right now. Yes. You see, these fries are swimming like fishes in the fat. <laughs> see? They are, I, I, you hear it? They are talking. You hear I hear it, yes. What are they saying? Oh, that they are ready to be eaten. <laughs> What do you need more? Taste one, please. <laughs> Is it the hot? Top of the fingers because it's hot, yes. Mm. Only a little bit salt on it and it's perfect. Mm. <laughs>
Oh man, it is perfect. I love that guy because he loves what he's doing and his fries are great. When you're traveling in Belgium or the Netherlands, be sure to stop by one of those outdoor French fry carts or those or the little hole in the wall French fry shops and get a cone of fries to go. It's just great. Remember, in that part of Europe, they don't use ketchup. You can get ketchup if you want, but they use um, mayonnaise. So try the mayonnaise and they've also got all sorts of other fancier sauces that you can try for dipping. That makes a lot of sense. And when you do go to Belgium, also you will be into the beer. Belgian beer is uh, arguably the best in Europe and that's worth checking on, taking advantage of. Mm. This Carlsberg's good too, but the Belgian beer is actually better. Now we're going to Switzerland. And here we have Lauterbrunnen Valley. Look at this valley. Mm. This is the greatest valley. This is where we take our, our, for 30 years, I've been taking my groups down this valley. And we were there filming and it was raining. It rained, it's, I've done 130 shows or something. I've never had such bad weather on the, as on the week we were here filming. And what we had to do, it forced us to do things not on top of the mountains. So we did things that were indoors, that were weather not um, reliant. Um, we went to a water powered mill, a traditional mill and watched them cut the logs with the water powered mill, just like they did centuries ago. That was beautiful. And we went up in the high country, we went to a beautiful farm where they make the cheese traditionally and they, they then uh, let that be their livelihood just like their parents and their parents, parents and parents, parents, parents. At the very end of this, you can hear the rain. We were, I'm actually huddled under the eave of a little cheese shack giving the last on camera. It was a tough time. We actually had to leave the cameraman for a couple of days to get some sunny shots before he went home, but it's the, the worst weather we've ever had. Thank goodness we don't normally have climate climate problems like this. But now let's go to Switzerland and make some cheese high in the Alps. Nestled in the bottom of the valley is the town of Lauterbrunnen. Its central location makes it a handy hub from which to explore either side of the valley. From here, a funicular, which carries bikes as well as people, takes me straight up the mountain. Excuse me, how, how steep is this? 61%. 61%. And have you come from that? Never. Never? Never go home. For 100 years? Yes. <laughs> this sure beats the stairs. And from the top, a scenic lane leads back to my starting point in Murin. Exploring this natural wonderland, you come upon great examples of how in Switzerland, tradition meets the modern world and survives. This water wheel, 150 years old, but washed out in a recent flood, was rebuilt with its blades still powered by a mountain stream. Almost all of the timber in the mountain villages around here was cut by water powered mills like this. Small scale mills are slower and more labor intensive than modern mills, but there's still a strong demand for this more expensive, but traditionally made local product. Milk cows spend their summers munching the wild herbs and flowers in the high meadows. Their milk is destined to become the treasured Alp cheese or Alpcasa. Alpine farms doing their traditional work welcome hikers and bikers for a peek at the cheese making action. This farm is newly renovated to meet European Union standards. Failing to meet these would mean the cheese could not be exported. But still, traditional quality survives all these modern regulations. Each morning, Veronica, a licensed and highly trained cheesemaker and her crew, milk the cows and heat a copper vat of milk over a wood fire. As it slowly curdles, it's stirred at just the right temperature until the consistency is exactly how Veronica likes it. At just the right moment, she swings the vat off the fire, then quickly dredges the vat with her cheesecloth and packs the fresh cheese into frames. This process is repeated every day for 100 days here in the high country. A cow's udder knows no weekend. In the next hut, yesterday's cheese takes a two-day bath in salt brine, and after a salty rub down, it's marked Alp cheese with a date and number and set on a shelf to age. Each village takes pride in its own cheese. This hut is full of local Alp cheese. Guten Tag. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Do you speak English? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, can I? Um, oh, I speak I'm Benning Deutsch. Can I? Oh, uh, Alp Kaiser. Uh, yeah. Probst. Yeah. Möchten Sie ihn testen? Ja, bitte. Ja. 
Okay. So this is for Alp case. Yeah, yeah. Alp case. Yeah. This is the Oberhalb. Just up here. Yeah. Along with the younger Alpkäse, village cheesemakers produce Hubelkäse, an older, stronger cheese aged for up to three years. It's named after the Hubel, or wood plane that's used to cut it. Oh, that cuts different, yeah. yeah. So this is that stronger. Is, yeah, yes. Mm, it smacks very good. Smack that in there? Mm, better. And you can buy it by the wheel, wedge, or wafer-thin slice to take with you on a hike. Yep. Besten Dank. Okay, okay danke schön. Schöne Zeit. Wiedersehen. Vielen Dank. Bye-bye. They say the character of the Alp cheese is shaped by the herbs and the flowers the cows munch. Some locals claim they can even tell in which valley the cow is grazed just by the taste. I can't, but the taste is great. Mmm, that's very good. Yeah, that, I'll tell you, that is terroir. We're riding a flying dolphin. That's terroir to be having cheese within ear, where you can hear the bells of the cows who, whose milk made the cheese. It's one of the most beautiful things in your travels is to be right there eating the culture. I hope you've enjoyed our food festival today. Um, I sure have. Um, I want to thank you for the excuse to do a little cooking. Uh, this is my second plate today that I've eaten because this is a double header. And I've enjoyed every sandwich. I hope you have too. I'm into my, what it's, for me, it's a dessert, this uh, goat cheese. And you got to try the goat cheese. It's, um, when I was a kid, my mom would send me to school with goat cheese sandwiches and uh, used to tell my friends it was earwax and it really grossed them out. <laughs> I had got to eat it all myself. But this is the iconic sort of package for the uh, Norwegian goat cheese, the Ye toast it's called. And um, uh, the other heroes of today's meal, it's very easy to put this together. Just Google Danish open face sandwiches and you'll see photographs and all sorts of menus. Horseradish is very important all over Europe for your beef. Uh, in Scandinavia, you got to have herring. I mean, herring keeps the Scandinavian happy. You'll always hear them talk about rumelada. That's the um, the sauce. But uh, really, tartar sauce will work here. You probably won't be able to find rumelada. Uh, the dill is really important for the garnish. And it's delightful to have a little dill on there. And a real good extra little um, dazzle would be with your uh, caviar. If you've never had caviar, buy a jar of caviar and, and uh, sprinkle it. Uh, it just brings a, it just carbonates the experience. All right. I hope you've enjoyed our extravaganza. I hope you've satisfied your appetite. I want to remind you next week, we're going to have a lot more travels. But right now, I want to answer your question. Let's go to Ben and, and see what questions we've got. Thank you so much, Rick, for that fabulous tour through European food. Uh, before we get to some great viewer questions, why don't you give us a word from our sponsor this evening? Oh, Ben, thank you so much. I love a chance to talk about our work. You know, you and me and 98 others are working together at Rick Steves Europe. Uh, we're having a lousy year from a business point of view because nobody's traveling, but that's just our lot in life. And for in tourism, we've had lots of good years and we're having a bad year this year, but we are, we are thankful that our society is on a glide path to normalcy and we are together. We've got our team working. We are hunkered down. We're going to get through this crisis and we're going to throttle up as soon as we can travel again. We make TV shows, we make radio shows, we uh, write guidebooks, and we take groups around Europe on our tours. The main way we make money is taking people around Europe on our tours. In 2019, we took 30,000 people on 1,200 different tours. This was our beautiful full cover tour catalog for 2020. We printed this up, and uh, of course, like anybody in travel, we just had to sit in all these boxes because we couldn't do any travels at all. But I love paging through this and seeing which tour speaks to me. Every year, I take one of our tours. We've got the same catalog geared up for 2021, and it's available as a PDF on our website. If you go to ricksteves.com into the tour section, you can check that out and see what tours we're cooking up. We have our hotels waiting and ready. We have our bus drivers waiting and ready and booked. We've got our tour guides all over Europe eager to get back into the saddle. And as soon as we can travel, we will. We're hoping to travel in the fall of 2021. Uh, if not, we'll be traveling this winter or I think worst scenario next spring, but we will be traveling again We've got about 15,000 people with their names on wait lists for these tours. If you want to be first to know when we're going to open up the sales opportunities for our Rick Steves tours, go to our website, put your name on the list, and then we'll be sure to let you know before the general public so you can grab a seat on the tour of your dreams. So thanks for your patience. Right now, we're all being patient because we got a more important work to do than make our travel dreams happen. We've got to get through this pandemic and take care of our neighbors, and we are doing that right now. 
but the day will come when we'll be traveling again. And uh, in the meantime, I'm really thankful we got Monday Night Travel and we got our audience, we got our travel partners, our buddies, and we've got a chance to answer some questions. First question, Rick, comes from Donald. Uh, what is the story on breakfast in Europe? Um, any tips on breakfast? Do you have a favorite European breakfast? Well, um, breakfast used to be horrible in Europe, if you're an American. It used to be just a croissant and a coffee. No, no protein, no juice, no fruit, no nothing, just a croissant and coffee. Now they've become much more healthy and, and a little more hardy with their breakfasts on the continent. In England, they've always had a big fry, a traditional fry. They call it a heart attack on a plate, you know, uh, bacon and eggs and, and beans and, uh, and uh, toast and uh, uh, blood pudding or whatever you like there in the traditional way. I really like their uh, big fry, but you can't eat that every day. Thankfully, now everybody's very healthy. So you've got fruit, you got yogurt, you got juices, you got a healthy granola. And uh, you'll find that the breakfast almost always now are a healthy buffet much like you'd find at a good hotel in the United States. Uh, we had a few viewers who are curious on how to find good restaurants that are not tourist traps, Rick. Any tips to that effect? You know, it's so fundamental, Ben. And I'll, I think a lot of people, as tourists, they're just tired. They don't want the language barrier. They're right there in the Eiffel Tower. And then here's a place that serves uh, hamburgers, you know. That's not what you do. You, you have to leave the tourist zone. I'm not talking take a bus, I'm talking walk for five or 10 minutes. And then you find a low rent spot that focuses on local diners rather than tourists. If you go a place that's designed for tourists, you're gonna get tourist quality and tourist prices. And worse than that, you're gonna be surrounded by tourists, just noisy English speaking tourists. I don't go to Portugal to listen to a bunch of Americans jabbering away. I don't go to Paris to have dinner with a bunch of American strangers. Frankly, I go to Italy to be surrounded by Italians. I go to Greece to be surrounded by Greeks. And in order to do that, you got to go to a local style restaurant. How do you find a local style restaurant? You find a low rent street. You find a no name little restaurant, a hole in the wall that's filled with a boisterous, fun loving crowd of people that are regulars. You look at the menu on the door. It should be small, handwritten and in one language, the local language, not English. Of course, they'll have an English menu in there for you to look at, or they'll have somebody to translate it for you. But you want a restaurant that is targeting the local clientele. That's why you want a one language menu. You want a restaurant that is not serving the tourist cliches, but that's serving what's good now, what's seasonal. That's why you want a handwritten menu. And you want a restaurant that is serving economic courses because that's why you want a small menu where they're just cooking up what they can sell affordably and profitably. If you do that, if you look at the restaurant and you like the crowd and the ambience, if you like the, what the menu looks like, if it's one language, small and handwritten, if it's on a low rent street, it's going to be a great restaurant. And that's what I spend every night when I'm in Europe looking for. And then I put them in my guidebook and we've just visited a lot of them tonight in our little extravaganza of restaurants across Europe. Now, that sounds very spontaneous, Rick. Uh, would you say reservations are ever needed for restaurants in Europe? Um, there's two ways to do that. Uh, you can wander around and see whatever looks interesting and generally find a place. But if you're going to look for a place that is recommended and has a good reputation, and the more I travel, the more I do that, to be honest. In that case, in a normal time with normal business, you do want a reservation. Europe in normal times is thriving. It's crowded and you need a reservation. So have a guidebook, make a phone call, make a reservation. It's that simple. Also, you got to remember many restaurants close one day of the week and it's not going to be Sunday. It's going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. It's their quiet day. And you've got a pretty good up, good uh, chance of go tra traveling across town to a restaurant that somebody told you about and it's closed on that day. So check out its website or give them a call and confirm that they're open. And it does help to make a telephone call to make a reservation. Uh, Cameron is curious, Rick, what your uh, food schedule looks like when traveling? Does it vary from country to country or do you have a fairly standard uh, dining schedule? You know, that's a good question. When I'm traveling, I'm working on my guidebooks. So my, my, my priority is to work during prime eating time because I have a two hour window for lunch and a two hour window for dinner when they are serving and I can feel the energy of a place. I can, the, the, a lot of times the harried waitstaff or manager or chef will say, come back later, I'm busy. But I don't want to see it later when he's not busy. I've got to feel it right now. So I make myself a little bit of an annoyance that way. But I have a big breakfast uh, at the hotel. 
and I have a sandwich in my bag for my lunch and I just grab a quick bite uh, somewhere on the run. And then my favorite thing is to spend the prime time of uh, eating, probably eight o'clock till 10 o'clock, visiting all the restaurants, checking them out, sampling them, talk to people, get to know what's going on, do all my work. And then just before they close up, I go back to my favorite place. And I just sit down and the chef is just about to cut it down. And I say, just bring me whatever you want me to eat. And it's so nice. I'm done with my work. I get to go back. The chef is done with his work. He loves to bring me some food. And then I just relax and have a very, very late dinner. Sounds kind of like a food tour a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, now, do you have a favorite national cuisine, Rick? A few people are curious. You know, I got to say Italy and France, Italy and France, Italy and France, Italy and France. Um, you know, all countries have good cuisine and you can find it, but I don't go to a lot of countries for the food, but I do go to Italy and I do go to France for the food. Um, you know, otherwise, when you're in different countries, you have different things you want to try. When I'm in uh, Spain, you know, I, I want to have gourmet tapas. I go to San Sebastian in Basque Country just for the gourmet tapas. In Portugal, I have great seafood. In in, in Greece, I love the meze, uh, uh, you know, um, but, but when I'm in Italy and when I'm in France, that's where you have this amazing food culture. Uh, and that's what I go for. Uh, one final question for tonight, Rick. It comes from Al, Emily, and several others. I think there's some concern about splurging a little bit too much on the good food. Um, any budget tips you might have? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting issue because it's expensive. I got to say it's expensive, but um, I would rather picnic for a couple of dinners and then go out to the restaurants I featured tonight than to always be eating at cheap restaurants. Uh, you need to have a quality dining experience. And I've found that you can go to a cheap restaurant and get a $15 bowl of spaghetti. You can go to the best restaurant in town and get a $25 bowl of spaghetti, surrounded by elegant people with beautiful service, and just having a, 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 a fine experience. I'm thinking of my favorite fancy restaurant in Rome where the politicians all go and the movie stars go. Uh, you know, and there's pictures on the wall with Bill Clinton ate there and so on. I mean, uh, that's the sort of the over the top fancy formal restaurant. I really love it and it's good food and it's 10 bucks more, but the experience is there. So um, I think you can order carefully when you go to a fine restaurant. Uh, you can have better food at lunch if you're on a tight budget. You can go to the same restaurants at lunch and have their lunch special and you're eating out of the same kitchen, but it's at half the price. But it is expensive to eat well in Europe. And you can, my friends say, you know, pay peanuts, get monkeys. You know, you just, uh, you want to get, you want to get a good experience. You want to eat well. Uh, if you want to just have a nourishing meal, have a picnic. I mean, I love a quality picnic for lunch and save enough money to dine out that evening. Hey, um, I just want to remind people, this is Monday Night Travel, and uh, we got so many great Mondays coming up. Next week, we're going to Rome with Francesca Caruso, our favorite Roman tour guide. The week after that, it's going to be musical highlights of Europe, and I'm actually practicing. I think I might practice tonight a little bit because I'm going to make a little recording and we're going to share. I'm going to take it to illustrate the sweep of art history in on the piano keyboard, Baroque, Neoclassical, Romantic, and Impressionism. But right now, I want to thank you for joining us on Monday Night Travel. I want to get meaningful eye contact, and I want to say skol. I want to say happy travels, even if we're just staying home for a while. We'll see you next Monday.